Matt Danaher, welcome to the Soccer Queens podcast. Thanks for having me, Erica. This is going to be such a great conversation, and I appreciate all of the work that you're doing as a soccer coach and just really starting to incorporate load management and performance into what you're doing. And you're such a good example for other soccer coaches on what is possible in terms of achieving high performance, as well as mitigating injury risk. So before we get into all that, just give a background on who you are and what you're up to today. Yeah, for sure. So Erica, thank you for having me on. Um, so my name is Matt Danaher. I am the director of performance at Fox Soccer Academy in um, North Carolina. Uh, up until a few weeks ago, I was the uh, director of sports performance for the Charlotte Independence. Um, so we had about 10,000 players um, that would not oversee, but I, I tried to write the performance programs for our national program. So any any teams that would be competing in ECNL or uh, regional league, um, you know, I was involved in planning out some of their periodization, um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But then before that, so uh, I grew up in Connecticut, um, so I'm a northeastern guy. I've actually trained with both of the men's and women's national teams, starting goalkeepers, which is very strange. I don't know what the odds of that are. Um, so I went to school with Matt Turner for two years at Fairfield U, and then Alyssa Nair is actually from. Um, I think she's from Milford. I I think actually she lives in Charlotte now. Um, her or her her twin sister does. But um, went to middle school with them. They were like five or six years older than me. Um, and have have trained with them, you know, a little bit, which is just really funny. So, um, after Fairfield, I went over to uh, Ireland uh, and and played a year there for uh, Salt Hill Devon, which is a team based out of Galway. I don't think they exist anymore. I think it's uh, it's Galway United now. Um, and then after that, I played uh, a year in Germany for FCA Darmstadt, not SV Darmstadt, which is the, the the big team that made it into the Bundesliga. So we were like fifth or sixth division. Um, but during that time, I was working with Tiff Weimer, who was a really good friend of mine or is a really good friend of mine. Uh, she coaches at Yale. We had just started a club in Connecticut. Um, and we really cared about load management with our players. Um, so we actually had them filling out Google Docs and SurveyMonkey and part of my job when I was in Germany was to take the survey monkeys and put them into a Google doc so that the coaches could see it. Um, because like anyone who's maybe played overseas or, or played, uh, obviously I wasn't playing professionally, but anyone who's played at a level where that's kind of your job. Once you train, you pretty much have the whole day open. So I was like, okay, you know, I can, I can continue to be involved in, in tips club and, you know, get the coaches, the information that, that they need. Um, and while that was going on, the, the gears in my brain started turning. I was like, one, I can't be the only coach that cares about this. Two, there has to be an easier way to collect this this data and information and and make it actionable for coaches. Um, So I took an online class on uh, Udemy, which is like a... um, it's like an online like database where you can pay like five dollars to take any types of any type of course. Um, but they had some really good ones. And one of the the courses I took, um, the way that they were building their app out was exactly the same data structure as what I wanted in in my app. So as I was taking the course, I started building Soccer Pulse. Um, that was in I think 2016, and then April 2017, I had an iOS version uh, and an Android version that were ready to be released and, you know, have coaches kind of get on board. And since then it's, it's kind of taken off. I think COVID dented it a little bit um, when the season shut down, that kind of hurt. Um, But it seems like over the last two years, everything's kind of revved back up and um, a lot of colleges use it. A lot of, uh, I don't want to say elite clubs because it's not meant to be an elite tool. It's supposed to be affordable. Um, But a lot of the, uh, like the really good girls Academy clubs, like nationals, uh, TSJ, Virginia, um, they're very adamant about player wellness, load management, um, and obviously doing it in a way where, you know, you can collect the data, but also use it because if you just have like a GPS unit or, you know, you're collecting heart rate data, but you don't actually use the data, it's kind of a moot point. You know, there's no real uh, reason to to do it other than the players think that they're, you know, being managed in some way. So, um, yeah, so so I'm in Charlotte now. I, uh, I'm working for Christian Fuchs, who uh, won the Premier League and, uh, you know, it's still doing my app on the side. So, you know, it's 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 busy, but it's it's exciting. Very exciting. And I really think that load management is the biggest missing piece in injury reduction. A lot of people are starting to get on board with, okay, let's get everyone strength training. That's step one. But mm-hmm. then a lot of coaches just collectively miss that program design, that that periodization. And uh, one thing that stood out to me with you was 
one of your tweets last month and you said there is no 10 minute injury prevention program. So can you just explain that and how you're using load management to help with, especially the ACL injury reduction? Yeah. So, um, it's always a pet peeve of mine when I see like, uh, they're like, oh, we're doing this ACL prevention exercise. I'm like, okay, what is it? And it's like five minutes, maybe not even five minutes. It's like two minutes of like directional hops. And I'm like, okay, like it's not a negative, but like ACL prevention is really like a holistic approach. It's not like one exercise is going to reduce or, you know, really make that big of an impact. So um, when I was at the independence, uh, in the regional league South. So, um, I was blessed with an amazing staff, um, like the, the director, the, the, the team coaches that I worked with were, were really great. And one of the things that we got really right with that group is recognizing that it was, you know, we had sports performance one night a week where we would do our strength training. Um, and we try to add in extra exercises throughout the week. It's obviously tough when you're in season because you're playing a couple games on the weekend and you're doing this fine balancing act between overloading the players, you know, and making sure that they're not overloaded and doing it at the right times and making sure they're still, you know, hitting the strength stuff that they need. Um, but it was really with, with our program over the last four years, I think we had three ACL tears over all of our teams. So that's six teams. Um, you know, if you do the math, I think that's like 24 seasons and we had four and some of the, the other coaches I was hearing from, they were reporting two to three ACL tears in a team in a season. And so what we did was, you know, we were like, okay, it can't just be a one day a week thing. It's got to be, you know, uh, the proper rest after if we have multiple games on the weekend, giving them an extra day off. Um, and it really comes down to the individual coach with their team, because what we would do, we'd have that one night a week of a performance session where all the teams would be together and do very similar things. But ultimately, the most contact time is with the coach. So the coach of the team has the most influence on the injury rates, um, you know, what they're doing, because one night a week, you know, that's 25 percent of the week. If we're training four nights a week, um, that other coach is going to have 75 percent of the time with them. So if, you know, uh, I do everything right in my one night a week session, but you run them into the ground and the other three nights, then it doesn't matter what I did with them on that one night. So we really had this great relationship with all the coaches that we were all on the same page in terms of our objectives um we talked about the the biggest thing being availability of players like we wanted to have almost every player available every weekend for every game that we played that was our goal in terms of our performance and if the test scores got better which they did that was a, an added bonus but ultimately we wanted to try and build robust players that weren't going to break down in season and in order to do that they had to be available to train every day. And we had to do it in a way that was obviously safe for the players. So, um, you know, I think we did a really good job with that. It was difficult to, um, to do it in the other parts of the club, because I didn't have that type of intimate relationship with the other staff members where like, I'm on the field with them every day. Um, and I think that made a really big difference in terms of, you know, the players and their performances, because um, just some additional context in the, in the South part of the club, we have, a, we had a very small player pool, so the challenge was if our players got hurt, we couldn't pull, we could pull players up from our lower teams, but they were not near the quality of the players that we had. So we were like, we really need to get everything right in terms of injury prevention, load management, the wellness reports that they would put in with, with the soccer pulse app. Um, and then just communication amongst the staff, you know, making sure that, you know, um, if we had multiple games coming up, reducing the load for those players. So they felt good at those events, you know, if they're coming off of that, making sure we reduce the load for them, you know, little things like that. And so it's when you hear like ACL prevention, it's not, it's not a five minute exercise a week. It is everything that you do with your players and how they also treat themselves off the field too. So, um, you know, if you, if you do everything right, I think, you know, that, that data set of four ACL injuries in, you know, in four years, I think it's a really good, example of what can be done and I actually some of the other some of the ACL injuries that happened in that season I still like I'm like man like I, I, I wish we had done something different um you know maybe there was something we could do and I think ultimately not every injury is preventable but I think you know if you take that holistic approach there's a lot of good that you can do with the with the athletes 
So for a lot of the coaches listening, this concept is very new to them with workload management and what calculations to look at. So I, I really want to break this down simply so that they can start to apply it or even utilize soccer pulse. So just like kind of walk me through a week and how you're talking with the coaches about each player, what you're calculating in terms of workload and like the data that stands out the most to you. Yes. Yeah, so I think the starting point is always the way that you want to play. So if I want to play a really high pressing style, if I want to really have the ball in possession, I want to connect a lot of passes, it's going to have a really high demand in terms of actions on the players. So I try and break it down into like, if you want to play very direct, it's going to have a lower demand. And the reason being is you're not asking your team to get really expansive when you have the ball. You're kind of just saying, okay, we get it. We lump it long and we we get forward. Um, if you're asking your team to press high up the field and you're asking them to really have the ball and, and be a possession-based team and really exploit space, um, when you lose it, obviously now you have to get compact. So that's an additional load on the player. Um, but also, you know, if um, if I'm playing a possession-based style, I'm asking them to to drop back every time they get the ball. It's, it's, it's much easier to just play, okay, I'm going to be very direct and, and get up the field. So I think your starting point is always how you want to play because the number of actions and like the the type of sprints that you're asking your players to perform, um, that's going to vary based on your playing style. So starting with that, um, and and obviously in the in the program that I worked with, in the programs I work with now, um, we have a very clearly defined style of play. We know how we want to play when we have the ball, how we want to play when we don't have it, and how we want to play in transition. Um, and usually, like the the styles that I just told you about, the possession, high pressing, and you know counter pressing when we lose it. That is a, a very high energy demand just because of the number of actions per player. Um, so I'd say for a coach starting off with this and being like, okay, how can I apply it? You have to figure out how you want to play first and then break it down from there and start to apply some some fitness laws or fitness principles. So like a really good example is um, midweek, like that Wednesday, that's usually the day that we overload our players. So we 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 push them in terms of the duration of the session. It's usually the longest um, the number of actions that they have to perform in their small sided games is usually the highest because they have the most time to recover before the next weekend. Um, and they also have the most recovery time from the prior weekend. So we want to we want to push them when they feel good, which is usually that midweek session. Um, so if a, if I'm a coach and I'm trying to figure out how to apply this, um, there's a really there's a really good book that a lot of coaches should read. So Raymond Verheijen is a huge influence on me, Tiff, um, a lot of the other coaches I work with. So um, it's called uh, like like football action theory. And essentially you're saying, you know, however many actions we perform in a minute um, for us to get fitter, we want to be able to do that for longer. So we want to be able to play at a higher, you know, higher intensity, um, very similar quality in actions from minute one to minute 90. Um, and if we can do that, then we've gotten fitter. And so what, what I'll do with teams in preseason is we'll, we'll bring them in and we'll play 10 minute games of however many players we have. And we're just trying to see at what point does the, the, the tempo of everything drop? At what point are we not performing the actions that we need to? Um, so a really easy example is with the 2010 boys that I have now, they'll do, I think they got to like, we did two and a half sets of, of 10 minutes. So they played about 25 minutes. And before they just couldn't run anymore, they were just gassed. They couldn't press. They couldn't possess the ball. So for me as a coach, I know that's my starting point. That is 100% capacity for those those players. So if I want to not overload them on a day, I would do half of that. I would do 50%. So it's starting to assign, you know, just like in strength training, you'd have your sets and reps and your, your recovery time in between. Um, I now know what their capacity is of 100%. That's the best they can do. So I want to push them past that. But at the same time, at other days during the week, I may want to take my foot off the gas and, and go a little bit lighter. So I already have a starting point in terms of the duration of the games that I play. So if it's like a Tuesday, then I know maybe we're still recovering from the weekend. Um, you know, we'll do five minute games because I know that that's not going to that's not going to fatigue them. It's not going to overload them. Um, so I think that's a really good place for most coaches to start is to say, um, how do I want to play? how long can we play that style right now? And then how can I push them throughout the season to get fitter and do it at the right moments? So I think, I think having a number assigned to um, 
you know, the, the teams and, and the style of play is really, really helpful. And Adam Tipper, who's the, the director of coaching at Fox, where I am now, um, we have, so we use the VO camera and we'll record them each week. And it's cool because we can show the kids, hey, you're getting fitter and you're getting fitter in the style of play that we want to play. And it's contextual, right? So it's not like we're putting you on the line and having you run, even though I think sometimes there's moments for that. But for the player, it's more fun and they get to see the actual progression. They're like, hey, I'm getting fitter as we get close to the season when the games start to matter and, you know, we need to, to have everyone at 100%. That's great. And I, I really think that gives some context co- context on how to manipulate small-sided games. And so, like, manipulating the time and the duration of the drill, are there any other ways to just, like, play with that load, like neutral players or target players? Like, what are some other things you're doing to either increase or decrease the load? Yeah, so... Everyone recovers differently, right? You know, you've got some players who, you know, they'll um, they'll recover very quickly after a session. You've got other players, usually you're more explosive players, or like if you're in, in, in a pro team, it's usually the older guys and girls, uh, women, I should say, um, that take a little bit longer to recover just because of, you know, physiological reasons. So using a neutral or using a, a target is great because now you're reducing the number of actions that that player has to perform in the session. So you're still including them, but they don't feel like, you know, um, they're, they're being treated just like every other player. And they may not even notice. You can have a conversation with them. I think if they're like, Hey, like, why do you keep making me a neutral? Um, but those are really good ways to, you know, not change your session and not take the player out of the session completely, but still, give them time to recover back to a hundred percent. So like in the 2010s that I have, we've got various degrees of um, maturity. So we've got probably four or five players that have gone through puberty and they're, they're big, they're explosive. And then you've got probably eight or nine players who have not had that growth spurt yet. So um, I try and rotate the players in terms of like, okay, player also had middle school soccer today. So he's going to be a neutral in the conditioned games that we play um, or player is going to be a target because no kid ever wants to be taken out of a session. And at the same time, it's like, how can I still deliver the session that I planned while also, you know, um, balancing the load on that individual player. And it's, it's tricky. I think it's at that point, it's kind of an art versus a science, but I think doing that is better than doing nothing. And I've seen really good examples of when, you know, players were really fatigued off the weekend, but you get them going and you have them play as a neutral, they don't have to defend. So they're not doing any defensive actions. And by the weekend, they're hundred percent again, and they're good to go. So I think those are little tweaks that, that coaches can employ in their sessions that don't change a whole lot and, and don't upset the player and, and still kind of get you to that, that end goal of, of keeping them healthy. As you were talking there, I'm just thinking about how much like thought goes into all this, how much diligence in your programming. And I think that might be a reason why a lot of coaches kind of bypass the load management piece because it Mm -hmm. is a full-time job, but it is so critical for performance and injury Mm -hmm. reduction and coaches end up resorting to things like, um, you know, conditioning as punishment or Mm -hmm. two a day practices, or just like completely like dropping and then spiking load and really putting their players in a bad position. And there really has to be that, that thought process and that macro level planning. And I know you've spoken a lot about your thoughts on two a day training sessions. Let's talk about it. (laughs) Let's do it. Let's talk about it. Go for it. it, You want to, you want me to just rant on it? Yeah, just go off. (laughs) Well, it's it's hard because like I I know why schools do it like I I was a division one athlete were you a division one athlete you did you play somewhere I played at Hopkins Division three okay but okay, we yeah, had so, three a days so yeah, yeah that's another yeah, rabbit yeah. hole <laughs> yeah we had we had a couple of those I mean it's hard for the from the coach's perspective because you've got in, in some of those cases you've got governing bodies who've set the rules and they're kind of like you have two weeks to get ready you have ten days. And so from a coaching perspective, you're like, I got to cram a month's worth of training into 10 days. Um, same with like the high school level, you know, it's very state by state and, and level by level. But, you know, you've got these rules that say you have 10 days to get ready for your season. And so what most coaches do is they just try and cram everything into that week. I think with college, you can get away with it if your players have come in at a really good level. Um, but like recently I've even heard about like some club teams that are doing two days and I just, I like it, it just drives me crazy because with most of the clubs you've got, like, like we have a six week preseason. We don't play our first game until September 10th, our first real like league game. 
And for most most clubs, like most of the ECNL clubs around here, it's and regionally gets the same. The games don't really start until September. So I don't understand the uh, idea of potentially compromising and losing your best players to an injury just to get an extra session in and say you did it for mental toughness. Like, I think if you're going to do two days, like a really tactical like walkthrough with the team makes a lot of sense. Like if I was coaching in college, I'd probably still do two days, but my second session would be very, very like, like walkthrough video session type of uh, almost a recovery session just to get the the, the players out again. Um, but when you start stacking volume in a really short period of time, you're, you're pretty much asking to pick up a soft tissue injury, um, you know, and, and a lot of coaches will chalk up soft tissue injuries to bad luck um, or that player wasn't fit and some, yeah. Okay. We can say that the player wasn't fit, but like, you know whose responsibility is that is it the coaches is it the players if it's the players i you know again you know they they're expected in college to come in at a decent level but at the same time they are what they are at that point so it's like you can you can not play them until you get them fit or you can get them hurt you know and um i think the if if coaches take one thing away from this today i think sometimes soft tissue injuries are bad luck Sometimes it's because of, you know, the the player's running form or some pre-existing issues that they have. But usually a soft tissue injury, injury is the 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 muscle being like, hey, whoa, this is I'm not ready for this. This is too much too soon. Um, you know, and, you know, that's why they they kind of pop up. So if you uh, overload progressively, so you start at a level and you gradually get them fitter, as opposed to, like you said, kind of spiking the level and, and dropping it again. Um, you can avoid most of them, not all of them, but you can cut down quite a few of the soft tissue injuries. If you just are very cognizant of, okay, we're going to push them here, then we're going to back off. And then, you know, as, as players become more robust and they have weeks and months of training and their chronic load, uh, goes up, then you don't have to worry about it as much. There's a really good article. I think it was on the Barcelona innovation hub. They have some really good stuff on there. And they were talking about the biggest, uh, uh, factors in reducing injury, were players having a high chronic load, like they'd been training pretty consistently through the weeks and avoiding those kind of spikes and, and valleys. You know, sometimes, you know, you need them and sometimes they come up, you know, they're unavoidable, like you have a bunch of games in a week. Um, but if the players are prepared for those, then, you know, there's a much, you know, lower chance of them picking up some type of injury. So I think with those two days, you know, if you have to do them because you're, you're you know, kind of hands are tied, then, you know, you, you'd be smart about it if you don't have to do them like some of these clubs I don't know why you would do it I just don't think it makes sense what about preseason fitness tests should coaches be having their players do the yo-yo test right out the gate week one day one should they do it, it depends. at all <laughs> it depends um I would say most schools don't use the information so I would say no um I think a lot of schools do it to say hey you need to come in at a decent level and then obviously you can kind of mark people against each other right if you do the game model test that you know we do at fox then it's um it's a little bit more subjective because it's based on okay i'm watching you and i see that you should be sprinting forward here but you're not whereas like obviously if you put players on a line if they can't make it we know that they they, they failed the test at the same time i feel like day one is when everyone's a little anxious and nervous and they're like, you know, especially the freshmen that have come in, they've never done it before. Their first time in a new environment probably didn't sleep well the night before. I know the night before preseason, at least my freshman and sophomore year, I, I remember I didn't sleep and it wasn't because I was nervous. Like I knew I was prepared. It was more like I was in a completely new environment and I just, my body just wasn't used to it. I hadn't adapted yet. So um, I don't, I don't do it because we don't do it week one. We, we will do the yo-yo probably right before Labor Day, just so the kids can kind of like, we know they're probably going to have to do it when they go to college, regardless of how many of these podcasts that come on and say, you know, you don't really have to do it. So the kids will probably still have to do it. So I think it's good for them to kind of see a level of where they're at in terms of doing it day one, week one. I just think it compromises the training after that because the players are so fatigued. It's like, you've, you've said that you don't have a lot of time to train and now you've already lost a day. Um, so I, I think it always depends on circumstances. I just don't always think it's the best use of use of time. And if you're, you know, not at a collegiate level, I don't really see any value in doing it personally. Let's uh, shift gears and talk about the off season prep. Now this gets a little bit sketchy because with the, the GA and ECNL kind of pushing into July of teams make, make the nationals. Mm -hmm. 
yes, we want them to back off after that's done, but then we want to build them up again to handle mm -hmm. higher loads and do high speed running to prepare for August and September. But I've seen mm -hmm. some girls in, in those leagues only have two to four weeks of a true mm -hmm. off season. And yeah. for me as a performance coach, it's like solving a calculus equation backwards. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. so crazy. So I'm just wondering how you handle that situation uh, because it, it is tough when you don't have that much time in an off season phase. And like, what do you usually focus on in that short window of time before the next season? Yeah, it's it, like with colleges, it's obviously much different because like when they they end in May, typically. So like um, when I was at Fairfield uh, and this is one of the reasons I got into strength training was I would go to a uh, performance center. Um, it, you, have you heard of Velocity Sports? I don't know. Are they still yes. around? Oh, they are. OK. Um, yeah. So I, I used to train there. And then one of the coaches that he was the best, one of the best performance coaches I ever worked with at Velocity, he left and started his own his own thing. And, uh, so I, I would train there every year before college. And then actually before my senior year, I did like an internship. So this is where I was like, I was like training and coaching at the same time, which is really cool. Um, but I always felt going into college preseason that I, you know, I had 10 weeks of strength training under my belt. In addition to whatever we had done in the spring, um, I felt like fresh, I was good to go. And you almost feel like those high school kids that are playing GA, ECNL, that they would really benefit from that. The problem is with their, you know, their schedule. It's like you go to nationals, you're in you're, you know, we went to the the regional playoffs for the independence in June. And these kids just came off of high school season. And then if you won that, you were going to nationals in Richmond in mid-July. And then your season started Aug one. So from the individual players' perspective, I don't think there's really a lot they can do. I mean, you almost have to try and fit in some of that strength training if you can. Um, and it's obviously not ideal, right? Because if you want to build muscle mass, you almost have to do less team training and more, you know, you need to give your body time to recover. And those calories need to go to building muscle mass as opposed to just recovering all the time. Um, from a club perspective, I told my, when I was at the independence, uh, I mentioned, you know, uh, my director and the staff that I worked with were, were really, really good. And we had talked about, we were like, if we go to nationals, we lost in the final um, of the regional playoffs, which is in June. But we said, if we go to nationals, we're going to give the kids an extra two weeks off in August, because otherwise they're going to be going from mid July of going to Richmond for playoffs to all of a sudden going right into preseason. And that's where you go to like also this balance of fitness versus freshness of like, the kids need time off. Like they, they need time to decompress when they finish their high school seasons in May. We told them that we give them at least two weeks off. I know some teams like started training right away, but we were like, we want them to just decompress from that a little bit. Um, so I think there's things that the clubs can do on their side in terms of scheduling and manipulating certain things to uh, be a player centered club first instead of a team centered club. The team centered club is or the club centered club is going to say you need to come back this day because we're getting ready for this event. And it's important that the club does really well at this event, not for the player. It's important that the club does really well at this event, whereas a player centered club is going to say we're going to do what's best for the players, which may mean a little bit less prep time, but it's going to be better for the kids long term. So um, I think, you know, again, from the player side, there's not a whole lot they can do. I mean, you can try and get those extra sessions in and just communicate that with your coach. Say, hey, like I am doing some strength training two to three days a week, um, just so you're aware of it. And then obviously you go into that individual, you know, periodization where it's like, OK, maybe you make them a neutral. But from a club perspective, I think there's more that they can influence in terms of like giving the players time off, encouraging them to get in the weight room, especially during that period of time when one season's just ended and you've got another one on the horizon. You know, it's the only real time that you have to kind of get in that that strength training work, like on a serious note, that's not like maintenance. So, um, yeah, that's that's my advice to the the clubs and then the players, too. I really like that. And it, and it really comes back to just having a, a macro plan in place of, of the whole year and making sure your players stay, they stay fit, they get their speed and strength training in, but then they have that period of deload and, and that time off. And what's really mm -hmm. interesting with a lot of the ECNL and GA girls that I've worked with is they'll come off of nationals in mid July. And for some reason they're asking for, Oh, I need conditioning. I feel out of mm -hmm. shape. And I'm like, well, how are you out of shape? You just played at nationals. You should be at your peak. You should be mm -hmm. covering that piece at practice. If you're doing proper load management and manipulating mm -hmm. small sided games. So 
I am very hesitant to condition players when they have four weeks off after nationals. It's like, wait, you should have already had all that. So Mm -hmm. how do you like navigate that situation? Do they need more conditioning or do they need time off? (laughs) Yeah. It's like that weird, like being unfit feels the same as being overtrained type of thing. (laughs) And I think a lot of players like probably more so on the female side, they get very like, uh, they're, they're very conscious of like, oh my God, I'm unfit. And now I'm not going to play well, or, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to be at my best. And they feel the same, like the, the overtraining and the, in the uh, being unfit feel the same because like you're struggling towards the end of games. But what I always tell players is like, you need to look at what your history is. So if you've not done anything for four weeks and you're saying, I feel unfit, you're probably unfit. If you have had a very rigorous schedule and you've been flying and you've been training and it's been the right kind of training and you feel that way too, you're probably overtrained. So you need more time off. Um, So that would be, that's the thing I always tell like players when I work with individually, it's like, you know, they're like, Hey, I feel unfit. It's like, okay, well, what did you do for the last three weeks? And if it's okay, we had double games. We had this, it's like, you're not unfit. You're overtrained. But if it's, you haven't done anything, then it's your, you're probably unfit. Is there a difference between overtraining and under recovering? It's a tough one. Um, I don't know. I'm going to punt that one to you. What, what do you think? If if players focus on proper recovery strategies, they're getting quality uninterrupted sleep. They're nourishing with high quality protein. They're they're hydrating. They can handle those higher training loads, but mm-hmm. at the same time, they they still need at least two days off a week. I would say mm-hmm. consecutive days, but yeah. I just, I just don't think they're getting that. I, I think under recovered comes in when most of the training variables are right. Like you've got yeah. maybe one or two games a week, two games a week, max, like it's Saturday to Saturday, you've got a normal training schedule and you're still kind of feeling like, you know, you're not sleeping, eating well, you know, you're, you're doing stuff that you shouldn't be doing all that stuff. Then I would say you're under recovered. I would say overtraining comes in where you're doing everything right off the field. You're getting your sleep, you're eating, you're eating, you're getting good protein in right after the sessions, you know, you have adequate, you know, calorie intake and you're like still not feeling recovered. And I think that's more of like volume stacking versus, you know, under recovered for me is like, you know, you're, you're not doing things off the field that you should be in your training schedule is normal. I'd say overtraining is like, you know, you're, you're just doing way too much and it doesn't matter how much you recover. You're never going to get back to where you should be. Right. And yeah, there's definitely some signs as far as the, the mental burnout, the Mm -hmm. lack of motivation to go to practice that, that would seem more overtraining for me and maybe like some mood changes and just not, not excited. And even if you're sleeping a lot, you're still tired. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm probably that way right now. I slept uh, <laughs> I slept 12 hours last night. And I guess it's different when you're chasing a toddler around. It's just like every time I, my daughter's like raring to go at 6 a.m. And I'm just like, girl, just please go back to bed. <laughs> I need more sleep. I could sleep 13 hours and still be tired. But yeah, I think I think it's, it's probably the most underappreciated part of, you know, being a, a young athlete is taking care of your body and doing, you know, everything that you're supposed to be doing right. Um, and um i think you appreciate it more as you get older like when you get to college and stuff but because you can maybe sometimes get away with it when you're younger um but at the same time like you know i don't think adequate recovery is going to help when some of these schedules that these kids have are just insane doing double sessions every day for a week with multiple games is it doesn't matter what you do you could get in a cryo chamber and you're still probably not going to recover in time so Amen. Amen to that. <laughs> and that's usually what people prioritize first without getting the basics down. Yeah. Now, yeah. Um, you, yeah, you've had a, a great track record with the, the ACL injuries and I, I've seen even like teams have four in one season. Mm-hmm. And the worst I've actually seen was I, I was at a division one college game and I saw two ACLs happen in the same half. So it's just devastating. And with all these factors in place, like our load management, our consistent strength training, our 
educational and recovery, we can really reduce that drastically. Now, before mm-hmm. we wrap up, are there any other factors that you focused on to keep your players healthy? No, I think it's also treating it more of an art than a science. So like with soccer pulse, you know, the, the players can put in their wellness. And I, I didn't mention this in the other segment we just talked about, but one of the things that Tiff Weimer, she's a huge fan of, of soccer pulse, obviously she probably was the inspiration for it, making me do those survey monkey things. But she says uh, the value in soccer pulse is not so much, you know, what the coaches can see in terms of like what you reported. It's that the players are asking themselves, how do I feel today? And, and kind of getting that down on not paper, but obviously digitally. Um, And, you know, I think it's, it's treating the players like they're people and knowing that every player is different and there's not an exact science to it. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll have players that are consistently very sore just in general, like they, that's, that's like their baseline almost. And then you'll have players who are not ever really sore. They're not ever really, you know, um, low energy, but when those moments happen where you notice that they're not where they should be, then it's like, okay, conversation, you know, what's going on. Um, So I think, you know, making decisions without having conversations with players is difficult. And I, and I don't think it always ends the way that that people think, because then the, the players may be less um, they may be less willing to share how they actually feel because they're worried about repercussions. Um, but at the same time, I think treating athletes and players like they're people and not, you know, machine robots that are consuming food and then going out and just running, you know, taking the human side of it and saying, okay, if something pops up, I'm going to have the conversation with them. Um, I think that has a big impact. And I think that's often uh, neglected. Um, You know, there, there was um, one situation I can remember. I think it was two years ago um, where we had a player who tore ACL in the first, she stepped on the field two minutes and she had, she had torn her ACL. And I found out later that she had been not eating well that week she had um, not slept at all. Her game was at like 9 a.m. And she had um, she had like some school function. So she was like, you know, maybe got three hours of sleep. And like looking back, I was like, maybe I should have done the 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 hard thing and said, hey, her name's not Jess, but hey, Jess, like I'm, I'm not going to play you today. It's just not worth the risk of it happening, um, of something happening to you. But that's also difficult when like the parents have driven two hours to this game. And now you're going to tell them right before that their daughter's not going to play in hindsight. Should I have done it? Yeah. hundred percent based on what happened. It was within like two minutes of her touching the ball. And it was very clear that she was not ready to play. And so, you know, that one still kind of haunts me a little bit, but at the same time, you know, hindsight's 2020, but I feel like having those types of conversations and knowing the context around your players, is it going to stop everything from happening? No, you know, there's stuff still going to happen that I'll probably look back on and be like, Oh, like what could I have done? Um, at the same time, I think having those conversations is really important because you get the full picture from the player and you can kind of, you know, maybe not prevent things, but there's more that you can, you know, it, and I think also the player knowing that you're in their corner and you care about them as a person, I think that that also goes a long way too. It is so hard when those injuries do happen and you just think about everything you did as a coach and every conversation you had and you're just like, oh my gosh, what would I change? But Mm -hmm. that's a good thing and it's good to reflect because there are so many factors involved and ways we can improve for our players. And I think you're doing great work with your coaching and soccer pulse. And I do want everyone to follow up with you and ask Mm -hmm. questions or maybe get on board with soccer pulse. But uh, where can everyone find you? uh so twitter's probably the best i think i've reached the level of followers where like and i'm sure you probably appreciate this too uh you'll get the the most ridiculous people rich reaching out to you or saying things about like a tweet that you're like you don't even know the context for this you're just like chiming in uh but yeah twitter's probably best so it's uh at matt danaher is my twitter handle um i'm on instagram too but i try and keep that private it's more like kid pictures and uh, maybe we'll do a coach account but like i try and just i wasn't on instagram until like three years ago and tiff was like you need to get on instagram because you know i was like i don't even know what that is that's how that's how bad that was um so yeah twitter's usually the best and i try and answer people as long as you're not being a troll and deliberately like one guy was like what's the value in what you just 
posted and I was like, the exercise I just showed is literally someone you hosted about a year ago. So maybe you should do your, your research too. But yeah, I think Twitter is probably best. And like I said, try and always reach out to people and, and have conversations. And um, I think one of the cool things about the app has been the number of connections I've made with schools. Um, and it's very clear that everything is trending that way in terms of people caring about their players, um, you know, trying to keep them fit, trying to keep them available. Um, but, you know, for, for anyone listening, obviously you're, you're taking the first step in terms of like, I want to be that type of coach. I would say like, don't, don't be late to this train because a lot of people are already jumping on it and trying to do a good job. And, you know, obviously there's still a lot of factors that need to change in terms of keeping players available and safe and creating good environments for them to thrive. But I think, I think we're trending that way, definitely more so than, than a few years ago. So Awesome. So everyone be sure to follow up with Matt. And you know, this is why I like these long form podcasts, because you can really go into detail. And I mm -hmm. think Twitter, you know, it's a great place for connections. But sometimes people do take tweets out of context. And it's just too short to know what someone's really saying. So mm -hmm. that's why I wanted to have you on. And I really want people to be educated on load management. So Thank mm -hmm. you again, Matt and everyone else. I will see you on next week's episode.